and she will bring forth a son, and you'll call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Matthew 1, 21. A reading from the New Revised Standard Version. In just 23 words, Matthew announces a truth that has changed the world forever. And there's really only one word in the 23 that's important, central. And oddly enough, it's the name of a baby boy. That word is Jesus. The name Jesus has a meaning, just like if your last name is Farmer, somewhere along the line, you had farmers in the family, or if you're Smith, there was a blacksmith or a goldsmith, silversmith, some sort of smith, metal worker. <clears throat> Jesus literally means God saves or repairs. Sin defines a dimension of human existence which God wants to save us from. Now, the reality of chain of sin, that does not change whether we recognize it or not, believe in it, believe in it or not. What we believe as Christians is that sin is an ordinary, everyday part of human life. And like everything else, it needs to be coped with. And God will help us do what we need to do to live well. Now, refusing to acknowledge the reality of sin simply handicaps us. It means that we have a less profound understanding of life. We have less tools in which to grow in our relationships, and we are more likely to hurt others. Not a good thing. None of that's a good thing. In the 70s, the, the um, legion of Secular advisors like Ann Landers, who always said, go see a psychologist, go see a psychiatrist, or Dr. Spock. They taught us to protect people's self-image, speak about mistakes, talk about poor judgment, and, and other words that, that describe the mistakes that are common or the missteps that are common to human beings that cause damage to self and more likely to others, but ignore God. See, secularists can't use a word like sin because it assumes the presence of God, and that's what they don't want to do. Unfortunately for all of us who have taken their advice, Changing the vocabulary does not change the reality. You see, God created us to live in a real world. He hardwired us for a specific way. There are requirements that are necessary for most people to cooperate with if we're going to live together happily in a society. And they're really not arbitrary. God has a purpose for each of us. There's a general purpose, which is to be a blessing to others and to receive gifts of grace and of love in order to grow in the spirit and become even more able to love others with a love that is similar to Jesus Christ. That's our purpose. And God has a goal for us that is, that is fit for who we are by our temperament, by our gifts by our interests that fit the human being we are. So there's a goal, there's a path from here to there, and it's not arbitrary. And if we leave that path, we're going to end up in a wilderness, maybe a desert, maybe a forest, but we're gonna end up someplace that is hostile to the well-being of people, both ourselves and others. And that's exactly what the word sin means in Hebrew, is to wander off the path into the wilderness. And so we get stories about the lost sheep and, and we talk about lost souls because that's what happens. 
we end up someplace we don't much want to be and we don't know how to get back. Now, we're advised over and over and over again that we should forgive ourselves after we realize that we've harmed somebody else and we're feeling shame. Because forgiving ourselves, after all, will help us to feel better. Have you ever tried forgiving yourself? For me, it doesn't work very well. Because you see, when I'm experiencing shame, I'm also experiencing the truth that I harmed someone. I didn't really have to. It's cost them something to know me, something precious to them. And frankly, the cost which I've created, the pain I've generated in another person, well, that's my responsibility. But they have the right to dispose of it how they will. Maybe they'll forgive me. Maybe they'll lay in wait and, and bushwhack me somewhere down the line. Maybe they'll just get mad. Maybe they'll cut me off. But whatever they do, I have created a burden for myself without much basis for self-forgiveness, really. Charles Dickens created a metaphor for all English speakers that, that I think is very powerful in his classic story, A Christmas Carol. <clears throat> Ebenezer Scrooge tries to go to sleep and is woken by the ghost of Christmas past. And the ghost takes him to his old boss who taught him how to be a nasty miser, Jacob Marley. As a young man, Ebenezer Scrooge thought that Jacob Marley had life just about right. But when he meets them, Jacob is wrapped up in chains. And every time he tries to move, they clink and clank. And Jacob explains that these chains are all his creation. They're all the result of decisions to be mean, to be stingy, to pass up joy, to ridicule love, to treasure stuff. And every time he did it, it created another link. Well, Jacob warns them that one link at a time, the chain's not heavy. But after a lifetime of creating links, the weight is crushing. Jacob is genuinely fond of Ebenezer and wants him to change while he still has the time. Now, the Bible teaches us about the weight of sin. It also teaches us that we cannot forgive ourselves for the reason that I just gave. It's not ours. The debt we create is in the life of someone else or in the heart of God. I think most people realize that. Even very secular people say things like, I don't know how I could ever make that up to you. Or, wow, I really owe you. We just sense there's this weight, there's this cost, and it's someone else owns it. Now, the notion of forgiving ourselves, well, that to me is, is kind of like walking into a bank and saying, today I'm feeling I need a little reinforcement for my self-image, so I'm going to forgive myself of my future car payments. Now, does anyone think that the bank branch manager is going to come out? Well, we don't blame you. Of, of, of course, it only makes sense, and we can hardly wait to give you another loan. Oh, no, that's just silly. The world doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way, really, with the pain that we cause other people. Oddly enough, <laughs> we reserve the right to retaliate or forgive or resent when somebody hurts us. Why is it so hard to grasp the notion 
that we have no right to require forgiveness from them. It Life just doesn't work that way. It just plain old doesn't. You know that. I know that. There seem to be millions of people out there that forget it. And you know, I hate to tell you this, but I do too every once in a while. But forgetting it doesn't change the reality, does it? Now, Jesus is the good shepherd. We have a path to walk where we'll live well, and Jesus leads us on the right path. 23rd Psalm. He leads us on the path of righteousness for his namesake. The good news of the gospel is that we are exactly right when it comes to sin, whether we use the word or not. We've gotten ourselves into a place that is hostile. It's not a good place. It's a desert or a or, or a, a wild woods or something. And we really don't know our way back. We're not kidding ourselves. We don't. But God is eager to lead us home. God reaches his hand out to us and smiles and says, you are forgiven. Take my hand. Come home. And because God has done that for us, God encourages us to do exactly the same thing for others. The word forgive in the English language makes perfect sense. The word forgive means to give up the desire or the power to punish, usually both. And so the plain truth is that when we mess up, the debt is theirs not ours. Now, what we can do, what we can do is we can apologize. We can change so we stop doing things like that. And we can treat people whom we have offended and hurt with a little extra consideration that says, I think you're a valuable person and I regret this situation. But what we can't do is to decide for them whether or not they're going to forgive us. So God calls us to do what we can do and come to him because the person we've hurt is also a child of God and confess to lay our sin at God's feet. and feel the grace of forgiveness. Once we acknowledge that forgiveness is a gift, and that's what the word is made up with, for the person that's in front of us, gives, gives us the process of the person that's before us, that's in our awareness, that our heart is breaking over because of shame. That's the person, the for person, that gives us a gift. You see, forgiveness is all about grace. In forgiveness, as another releases us of the debt that we owe them, we can just about feel that chain fall off of us. The one we've created one link at a time and the relationship, it just falls to the ground and we walk away from it with the possibility of developing new habits, of starting again, and creating a relationship that's even better than the one that we missed. We don't forget our sins. We remember them, but not to beat ourselves up. We remember them so we know where we don't want to go back to. <laughs> it helps us to stay on the path. And we seek out and begin to new, to live new patterns in our relationships, typically not just with that one person, but with everyone. We know that we'll experience the consequences of old, hurtful decisions. The divorce is final, and even if we confess the most wonderful confession and our ex forgives us from his or her heart, the divorce is final. The freedom 
is amazing, but there are consequences. We may have lost a friend permanently, the job may be gone, but we don't have to mess up the same way on the next one, do we? No, there are consequences, but the moment we grasp God's grace and the forgiveness, the gift from the person that's on top of our head or in our heart because we have a hurt them and we know that. The gift from the four person frees us. Yes, I believe in the forgiveness of sins. You better believe I do. I believe that God has no desire to harm me. God has no need to punish you. What needs to happen here is for us to release our shame because God has released our debt. That knowledge makes it possible not only to put shame in the past, not forget it, but for it to stop chewing on it, put it in its right place in the past. That knowledge makes it possible for us to begin new and different lives. And the new and different lives based on the experience of forgiveness and the gratitude that comes from it and the wisdom that we gain. Well, that's very good. That's very good. And so every night we pray, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. It's right there in the Lord's Prayer. Do I believe in the forgiveness of sins? Oh, yes. And it's a very wonderful thing.